Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, good morning to all of you. And you know, I have to say that having been here at the first conference put together by this organization, um, it is so exciting to be here at the tent. As I was uh, talking with Sue when I got here last night about the work that both the Institute is doing, but also that you are doing, I just got to say, talk about heroes. It's you folks who are doing the work and the person who has enabled that. Sue, congratulations for this work. It's just awesome. <laughs> Other states. Other states would be very blessed to have this kind of um, mechanism to actually help people who want to get better at their work to actually do that. So I'm not here as your cheerleader though today, so let me talk a little bit about what I'm going to try to do. What I'm going to try to do is kind of pull you outside of your context for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. And we're going to walk together through some data that will help us look at what's happening to different groups of children as they take the journey from kindergarten toward college. We'll talk a little bit about the obvious problems that you see in the data, but most of all, what I want to do with you is share what we're learning from places around the country who, like you, are really tackling these problems head on and getting better results. One quick word about the data before I begin, and that is I'm always aware that there are numbers geeks in the audience who love to write numbers uh, down. So let me just tell you in advance, I will make you crazy because I'm gonna go way too fast for those of you who wanna do that. So just know that all of what I'm about to show you, <coughs> excuse me, we will park on our website and I'll show you how to get there afterwards. Or if you wanna do the easy thing, about halfway through this presentation, I'm gonna pass around this purple basket and if you just toss in it either a business card or if you're a teacher a piece of paper with your email address uh, on it, um, we'll send it to you later on. So don't worry about the numbers. Before I talk about the numbers though, I, I want to sort of back up and talk with you about why the work you're doing is so very important. You all certainly know that our country, <clears throat> you know, we have told each other in the world sort of two very important stories about who we are as a nation. The first one, of course, is that we're the land of opportunity, that whether your parents were born in a village in India or in the hollers of Western Kentucky, that we are the place above all others where if you work hard, you can become anything you want to be. So we're the land of opportunity. The second story that we've told each other in the world is that we're constantly getting better. That each generation of American parents through hard work and savings can assure its children a better education and in fact a better life. Those stories, as you know, have been very powerful. They have animated the hopes and dreams of millions of people here at home and they've certainly drawn countless immigrants to our shore. Now this country was built on the backs of people like them, right? And yes, they knew that America was often intolerant of people who looked like them or who struggled with English like them. And they knew back then that the American dream was still a work in progress. But they were proud, as all of you know, of the country they were building. We were the first in the world to provide universal high school education, the first in the world to build public universities, the first in the world to build public community colleges, the first in the world to broaden access to college through the GI Bill and then through Pell Grants. And gradually, over time, education levels moved upward at both the high school and at the college level. <coughs> Yes, sometimes progress was painfully slow, and certainly, as you all know, painfully slow for people of color. But for them, too, education levels moved upwards, <clears throat> and opportunities expanded outwards, until, that is, <clears throat> about 1980. Beginning in the 1980s, as I suspect all of you know, inequality in this country started growing again. <clears throat> earnings among those at the top of the economic ladder have grown exponentially in recent years. 
while earnings among those at the bottom of the economic ladder have remained flat or actually declined. Now, in fact, instead of being among the most equal nations on Earth, we're actually one of the most unequal nations on Earth, with the third highest income inequality amongst developed countries. <clears throat> the median wealth of white families in this country is now 20 times that of African Americans and 18 times that of Latinos. But importantly, it's not just inequality in wages and wealth, but problems with economic mobility as well. Now, in fact, instead of being the place on Earth where if you're growing up in poverty and you work hard, you are most likely to have a better life than the ones your parents had, we're now tied with the United Kingdom for being the place on Earth where if you're born in poverty, it is hardest to have a better life than the one your parents had. Now, in fact, if you're born poor in Canada, it is easier to realize the American dream than if you're born poor in the United States of America. Now, when you think about those overall patterns, you know, because you're educated folks, that better and more equal education is not the only thing that needs to change in order to turn those patterns around. There's a lot of things that <clears throat> enlightened public policy could and should do. But at the individual level, of course, quality education literally is the only way up. As generations on generations of African American parents have taught their children, quality education is literally the only thing that nobody can ever take away from you. So why do I tell you that? I tell you that primarily to remind you that what you're doing, that what our schools and colleges do is hugely important. It's important, as all of us know, to our economy, but it's equally important to our democracy and to returning our country to the principles that we hold dear. So if what we do is important, and if how we're doing it is important, how are we doing right now? I'm gonna start actually with some good news. Those of you who've looked at the national data over time probably know it was a while since we had good news. During the 1970s and 80s, we actually made a lot of progress as a country in raising achievement, especially among low-income kids and kids of color. But right around 1990, that progress literally stopped dead in its tracks. And all throughout the 1990s, the gaps between groups were actually getting wider again. So here's the good news. What you're looking at there is fourth grade reading performance for the country as a whole by group over time. As you can see in the last 10 years for which we have data, what do you see? Sharp improvements for all groups of kids, especially fast improvements for the groups of kids that have been behind, the result being record performance for all groups of kids and the smallest gaps between groups that we've ever had in this country's history. Good news too, as you can see there in fourth grade math, where again over the last 10 years you're seeing sharp improvements for all groups of kids, record performance for all groups of kids, and also the smallest gaps between groups we've ever had. Now that was a look at what's called the NAEP Long-Term Trends Exam, which is the longest standing unchanged test given in this country for more than 30 years. There's another NAEP exam called the Main NAEP exam that shows very much the same progress. And for those of you who have a little bit of time, sort of a hard time sort of visualizing, okay, what do those numbers actually mean for individual kids? Let me show you the data a little bit differently. What you're looking at there is fourth grade mathematics performance for the country as a whole back in 1996. And <clears throat> let me give you a quick clue to what you're seeing. Wherever you see red, those are the kids about whom we need to worry a lot. They were performing at the below basic level, means they're not even close to having the skills and knowledge we know they need in the years ahead. Green kids, by contrast, are doing just fine. They're proficient or advanced. Yellow someplace in between. So let's focus on African-American kids. Back in 1996, roughly three quarters of African-American fourth graders were trapped at the below basic level, 73%. Meanwhile, only 3% were proficient or advanced. Let me fast forward to today. As you can see, those numbers at the below basic level more than cut by half. Meanwhile, six times as many at the highest achievement levels. 
And you see the same progress when you look at the data for low-income kids as well. Now, when you move up to the middle grades, you see much the same pattern in mathematics, a little bit of weaker results, but still some progress in reading. But the bottom line, I think you'll agree, is very clear. When we really focus on something as a country, and most important, when we focus on something as a profession, the fact of the matter is we make progress. And those of you who've had a chance to study the history of American education certainly know that if there's one message from our history, it's actually that one. When we really focus on something, we make progress. Now, focusing on the progress at the elementary and middle school level, I don't want to suggest that there's not a lot that remains to be done. Any of you today who are working at the high school level are very much aware that there's still a lot of kids who are entering high school without even close to the knowledge and skills we know they need to succeed in the years ahead. But the good news is at least we have some traction on that problem. When you look at, at successive years of data on kids exiting from elementary school and moving up, exiting from middle school and moving up, what we're seeing is Fewer and fewer kids in the red category, more and more kids in that green category, which again tells us we have some traction on that problem. The same, unfortunately, is not true of results in our high schools. What you're looking at there on the screen is reading at the end of high school over time. As you can see, that line is not headed in the direction we like it to head. What that is actually telling us is that kids today are exiting high school with some weaker skills in reading than their counterparts had uh, 30 years ago. And when you turn over to mathematics, the results, frankly, are not much different. A little bit of progress in the late 1980s and early 1990s, but flat or declining since that time. And those gaps between groups that I showed you narrowing at the elementary school level and narrowing at the middle school level, not at the high school level in both reading, as you can see there, and in math. The gap separating both poor kids from middle class kids and kids of color from white kids are actually as wide today as they were back in 1990. Moreover, no matter how you cut the international data, our kids are not doing well compared to their counterparts in other countries. Currently, our 15-year-olds rank 17th out of 34 developed countries in reading. They rank 20th out of 34 developed countries in science and in mathematics that all of you know is the single largest predictor of lifetime earnings. Our kids rank 27th out of 34 in the developed world. In fact, the only place we rank high as a country on the international assessments is probably not some place we're very proud of ranking high because it's the inequality of our results. Despite the principles on which we were founded as a country, we have the fourth largest gap in the developed world in science between rich and poor kids, the fifth largest in reading, larger than the national average in math, and we are particularly, particularly falling behind in proportion of low-income kids that we get to high levels of mathematics achievement. So let's talk about those gaps. There's not a person in this room who doesn't know, when you're looking at your data, whether you're looking at data on your school or your school district or on the state or on the country as a whole, and you see gaps between different groups of kids, you know that some of that began before kids even arrived at the schoolhouse door. All of us certainly know that in this state and in the country as a whole, every year there are kids who arrive at school already behind. Sometimes that's because of poverty, sometimes that's because of language issues, sometimes that's a result of family stresses, but regardless of reason, a significant number of kids arrive at school already behind. So the question is not whether that occurs, we know it occurs. The question is, how do we organize our educational system to respond? And what you learn when you look honestly at that question is that rather than organizing our educational system in this country to ameliorate that problem, we actually organize our educational system in this country to exacerbate that problem. How do we do that? We do that very simply. We take the kids who come to school with less, and we turn around and we give them 
less in school two. In fact, it, it, it turns out <clears throat> that we take the kids who arrive at school behind and we give them less of everything, and I mean everything, that both research and experience tells us makes a difference. And then when they don't perform so well on standardized tests, who do we blame it on? We blame it on the kids, we blame it on their parents, we blame it on their race, we blame it on their culture. We actually never, ever talk about what we do. So how does that happen in the United States of America? Well, some of the lessons in the education of poor children and children of color flow from choices that other people make. That includes the choice that many state policymakers have made to just plain spend less on the education of some children than they spend on the education of others. And what you're looking at up there on the screen shows how those choices made largely by state policymakers play out in the country as a whole. So some of this, pure and simply, this less stuff, is a function of choices that other people make about who's worth spending on education and who's just a little bit less worthy. And most educators I know don't approve of that choice and in many states educators have worked very hard with others to convince state lawmakers to put into place fair and more equitable finance systems. But at least in my experience, while most educators I know wouldn't have voted to approve such a system, there's a lot of folks in our profession who actually take a little comfort in that choice. Why might that be? Because once again, it makes the achievement gap not about us, right? It makes it about those policymakers, or once again, about the kids and their parents. But the truth of the matter is that most of the most devastating lessons in the education of poor children and children of color flow not from the choices that the policymakers make but rather from the choices that we educators make. Choices we make, for example, about what to expect of whom. No policymaker in America made us do that. Choices that we make about what to teach to whom. No policymaker in America made us do that either or that. And then, of course, there's the most devastating choice that we make of all, and that is the choice of who teaches whom. And no matter how you look at the data, what is absolutely clear is that poor kids and kids of color are far more likely to be taught by brand new teachers who are still struggling to learn their profession, far more likely to be taught by teachers who are being asked to teach a subject they never studied in college, and far more likely in the places where we actually have data on who's effective and who's not, far more likely to be taught by our least effective teachers, and far <clears throat> less likely to be taught by our most effective teachers. You add up both of those lessons, both the lessons from the policymakers' choices and the lessons from the choices that we make, and the results are simply devastating kids who arrive at our doors about this much behind are actually leaving us about this much behind. The gap, in other words, that separates both poor kids from middle class kids and the kids of color from white kids actually grows wider and wider and wider the longer they remain with us in school. <clears throat> and those, of course, are the kids who actually remain with, with us in school. A fair number of them, as all that we know, don't. But you add those numbers up and throw in college entry and college graduation rates, and what you end up with is very different degree acquisition rates for different groups of young Americans. Essentially, for every 100 white children we start with in our kindergartens nationally, roughly 89 or 90 end up with a high school diploma or a GED, and as you can see here, about 40 end up with at least a bachelor's degree. For African Americans, the bachelor's rates are only slightly more than one half those of white students, or Latinos only roughly one third. And when you look at the data by family income, even more devastating differences still. If you look at American families in this country that are in the top economic 
quartile. So families, by the way, where the household income is about $80,000 a year or above. You look at their children around age 24 or 25, what you'll learn, as you can see there, is roughly 8 out of 10 already have at least a bachelor's degree. But if you look, on the other hand, American families in the bottom economic quartile, those are families where the household income, like many here in Indiana, is $30,000 a year or below. Look at their children at roughly that same age. What you'll learn, as you can see there, is only about 11% have that same bachelor's degree. Now we're asked all the time, what are we trying to suggest there? And the data is really pretty clear. What the data suggests is that unless you and I are somehow prepared to argue <coughs> that children from upper middle and upper income families are more than seven times as smart as children of the poor, this is about as clear a signal that we have that something's going very seriously wrong in these two systems of ours, K-12 and higher education, because that is precisely the result we're now getting at the end of the line. More than seven times the results for children from upper middle and upper income families that we're getting for children of the poor. So that's a quick look at where we are. The question, of course, is, okay, if that's where we are, what can we do about all that? You know, one of the things that is very important that we acknowledge, honestly, especially in rooms like this one, is that there's a fair number of Americans, and frankly, a fair number of American educators who basically don't think there's anything that we can do about the numbers that I just showed you. How do we know that? Well, we spend a lot of time, as you know, is all around the country with audiences of educators and others. Um, and sometimes, rather than go on with the Y slides, we just turn off the computer, shut down the projector, and turn to them and say, OK, you've seen the numbers. Talk to us about what's going on here. So here's what we learned. No matter where we are in the country, they make exactly the same list. What do you expect, they say? The children are poor. Their parents don't care. They come to school without an adequate breakfast. They don't have enough books at home. They don't have a quiet place to study at home. They live in difficult neighborhoods. They don't have enough parents. A whole list of reasons, in other words, that is always, always, always about the kids <laughs> and their parents. But our question back to them is a pretty simple one, and that is, but wait a second here, if you're right, if, in other words, things like poverty or difficult home circumstances cause low achievement, if those things make low achievement inevitable, how then can it be that very poor kids and kids of color are performing so high in some places? How can that be? So we don't have a lot of time for examples, but I want to give you just a few. I want to start in Mobile, Alabama. I don't know how many of you have been to Mobile, Alabama, but if you visited downtown Mobile today, you would see what looks like 99% of the kids aren't just low income. These are very, very poor kids. This is a neighborhood that has been racked by gun and drug violence for decades. Almost everybody lives in subsidized housing, very few work. This, in other words, is a really, really ravaged neighborhood. Now, it will not surprise you to know, given that, that for many, many years, this was the lowest performing school in all of Mobile County, and one of the lowest performing schools in all of Alabama. And I remember, to this day, a conversation some years ago with the school board president in Mobile County, who said, you know, every year we get the data, and we sit around in the boardroom, and we look at the numbers, we'd see the George Hall numbers, and we'd feel really awful. But then, somewhere in the next few minutes, somebody would say, well, you know, what do you expect? Look at the kids. Look at their parents. And he said, and we'd just go back to business as usual. But one day, under the pressure of sort of continued public embarrassment and the pressure of state accountability systems, the school board decided to do something about this school. And they identified a very, very um, uh, successful principal from elsewhere in the district, a woman by the name of Terry Tomlinson. 
And they asked Terry if she would take over leadership responsibility in the school, and she agreed. <clears throat> they also made everybody in the school reapply for a visible job. Now, <clears throat> Terry told us, you know, I didn't rehire a single administrator, not one. I didn't rehire a single teacher either, not one of them. Not, she said, because some of them couldn't be good educators elsewhere, but because over time, this kind of miasma had taken over that school and just taken people down. And I think some of you know what I'm talking about. This thing that sets in, in very low performing schools over time, where, where the adults in the school don't just give up on the kids, but they give up on themselves as well. And what Terry told us is, I needed educators who, when they looked in the eyes of the children in their class and saw future business people, future firemen, future doctors, you know, future political leaders, but when they looked in the eyes of the kids, they just saw future drug dealers, future thugs. They said that we couldn't have that. So they restocked the school with educators from elsewhere in the district. Now the people who left weren't very happy because as you know, places like this, although they're really ugly places to work, can also become safe places for people who just don't want to work. And so when they left, they took uh, their rage out on their successors by rubbing the halls of the school with dead fish and by stuffing dead cats in the ventilation system. And you can imagine, this is Mobile, Alabama. Friends, it's very hot in the summer. You can imagine what that school was like um, when they went to reopen it. But what's important for you to know is nothing about that deterred the team at that school from the mission they were on because they know what you know and that is for the children in this neighborhood what they did represented the only chance that these kids had to live their lives not out there on the margins where their parents had been forced to live but in the mainstream they knew that as a result of that they could not waste a single minute and they were about as deliberate and purposeful about every aspect of instruction that I, that I have ever seen. This, just to give you one idea of how this plays out, they believe in field trips, as I'm sure some of you do. They know that when kids are living in settings like this one, it's really important to get them out to see other stuff. But boy, on the bus going to the field trip, they're working on vocabulary all the way there. On the way back, they're working on math every, every minute. They don't leave a single minute wasted. They are that much on a mission. Take a look at their progress. They have gone from one of the three lowest performing schools in the state to one of the highest performing schools in the state. And they, by the way, if I showed you this in front of the principal, they'd say, don't show, show that because that's just proficient. Show them advance. What they know is that for poor kids, you really don't want to just be aiming at proficient. You want rock solid advanced level performance and that's what they're focused on. What you see here, fifth grade is the highest grade in that school, is the number of kids in the left hand bar at that school who now hit the advanced level on the state performance. Um, and just to give you a sense of context, on the right-hand bar, that's the number of white children in the entire state of Alabama who hit that level. <coughs> very poor kids, very challenged neighborhood, rock-solid results, higher than those for white children in Alabama. And it's not just there. Halle Hewitson Elementary School is a very different school located in Las Vegas, Nevada. But this school, too, show, shared a long history of low performance. In fact, for a long time, one of the lowest performing schools in the entire state of Nevada. This case was a little bit different, though. As you can see, the student population there is largely Latino, and a very large number of the kids were limited English proficient. And this was not a situation of low expectations. This was a situation of low skill. None of the teachers in that school had any training or any support at all in how to teach English language learners. By the luck of the draw, they got a principal who did know something about that and who led them in a multi-year process of really developing rock-solid strategies in teaching English language learners. 
But she also did something that I suspect all of you know is important, and that is she built bridges to parents and to others in the community that really strengthened that school's kind of net and built a lot of supports around kids. Because what she know is what lots of educators too often forget, and that is even parents whose own education levels are quite limited, even parents who themselves struggle with English will, if you make them partners in their children's learning, if you communicate accurately in language they can understand where their kids are struggling, they will be your partners and find support. And that's what they did. Take a look at their progress in such a short period of time. Again, from one of the lowest performing schools in all of Nevada, consistently now outperforming some of the most affluent schools in the state, not just in reading, but as you can see here in math. And they too are very uncomfortable with just shooting at proficient on the state assessments. So as you can see here, more than twice as many of their students hit the advanced level than is true in Nevada as a whole. And by the way, it's not just elementary and middle schools. <clears throat> Welcome to Elmont Memorial Junior Senior High School, which is one of our favorite secondary schools in the country. This is a school, as you can, as you can see, that serves roughly 2,000 kids, most of them African American or Latino, in grades 7 to 12. About 10 years ago, a new principal arrived at the school, a gentleman by the name of Al Harper. And Al tells a kind of funny story. He said, you know, my first day of showing up at work at the school, I walked up the front steps of the school. I was greeted at the door by my two assistant principals who said, welcome, Mr. Harper, to one of the best minority high schools in the state of New York. And Al said, you know, as a black man, I said to myself, what the heck did that mean? One of the best minority high schools in the state of New York? Why aren't we one of the best high schools in the state of New York? And that, my friends, is what they set out to become. Now, Al was one heck of a leader. He's now the superintendent in the elementary district that feeds this school. And his successor as a principal, John Capozzi, is a terrific school leader as well. But let me be clear here. The real leaders of instructional improvement at this high school are the department chairs, that is, the teacher leaders. This high school has one of the most fabulous sets of department chairs of any high school, or frankly, I would argue, any college in the country. These teachers care so much about the quality of teaching that goes on, not just in their own classroom, but in every classroom in their department. They think about almost nothing else. In fact, when you visit the school, you are constantly interrupting sessions among the department chairs, trying to strategize about where to take their folks next, who needs help, who doesn't. They go out for training themselves. They bring people in. I mean, it's this incredible just learning machine. In fact, our folks have become convinced that even teachers who would be, be merely ordinary in other schools become superstars at this school. Let me show you their results. These are the results on the New York Regents English exam compared to all other high schools in New York State. These are their results on the New York Regents math exam compared to all other high schools in New York State. And by the way, lest you think they're getting these results by pushing kids out before graduation, take a look at that. Their high school graduation rates compared to all other high schools in New York State. Bottom line is, and if you're interested in reading more about these schools, there are three books now written on them that take you sort of in detail into the stories and lessons from these places. The bottom line is really, really clear. Don't let anybody ever tell you that what you do doesn't matter, that it's all about the kids. Don't let anybody tell you that schools can really only do so much. It is very clear, clear that when the adults at a school take real responsibility for student achievement, when they do the things you do, right? build teams, look at the data, understand the causes, and act, they get results, right? They do. And by the way, there's a lot of people who said, you know, when they see us come in, they do the same thing, right? It's, uh, oh, right, there's those that trust people, they have their fabulous, high poverty, high performing schools, but you know, 
Those are the freaky schools, the fluky schools, the outliers, the schools that exist on the sheer force of some principal's personality. You know, we can never do that. It's sale, they grumble. So they say, you know, it's really, if you add it up at the district level, it's really about the kids. And we've been trying to understand what's going on in people's heads when they say that. And what we've come to understand is there are a whole lot of people in this profession of ours who walk around with this idea in their heads that group performance is just kind of monolithic. In their minds, African-American kids perform sort of here. Latinos perform sort of like them, sometimes a little better, sometimes a little worse. The white Asian kids, they think, perform all up here. So what they think is that your performance as a school, or, or certainly as a district, is just mostly a function of how many of each group you have. That's what they think. Group performance is just one with it. Well, it turns out that's not even close to true. And one of the ways we know that is a few years ago, a group of our biggest districts decided to give their kids the same test. So you could look across those districts at the same group of kids and ask the question, do they pretty much perform the same no matter where they go to school? So this is a look at African American kids across those districts. Let's look here. It's performance of African American fourth graders in Charlotte. Let's compare it to the performance of African American fourth graders in Cleveland. That gap you're looking at there is not the gap you're used to looking at. It's not the black-white gap. That is a gap in the performance of black kids in one district and black kids in another. Just to give you a sense of the size of that gap, more than two years worth of learning. Two grade levels worth of learning. You see the same difference when you look here at Latinos. Houston on the left. Uh, Fresno on the right. That difference, almost three grade levels. So don't let anybody ever tell you that what you do doesn't matter, that it's really all about the kids. In both performance, and as you can see here, in improvement, there are big differences. What you do matters. There are differences, again, in how well kids are doing and differences in how fast they're improving. You even see differences at the state level as well. In other words, what is very clear and it's equally clear in your own work is when we really focus, when we take ownership, we make progress. The only question for us as a country is when we're going to do this at scale, when it's just moves beyond just a few people volunteering to do this work, when we know we can do it at scale. So what are the key ingredients we learn from these places? And Sue, could I toss these to you and ask you to just shoot them going around the room? Thank you. So what do you learn when you look at the high performers? The first thing you learn seems simple, but it's less simple than you think. And that is, it starts by believing. And you know, one of, one of our favorite principals, a guy by the name of Jeffrey Witt in New York City, said it this way, and I really love the way he said it. He said, many people say all children can learn. Well, that's true. But all parakeets can learn, too. <laughs> what we're talking about here is not not that. What we're talking here is people who believe that all children can excel. That, I think, is what sets your work apart, but it's also what sets the work apart of schools around the country. One of our other favorite principals said it this way. She said, look, through my teaching experiences, and she taught in some of the toughest schools around, I learned that my students were capable of learning just about anything I was capable of teaching. But these are folks who recognize that it's about what we do, that the potential of children is unlimited. And for those of you at the schools, believing in the potential of all kids is not just for those inside the schools, it's for those outside as well. And what does that mean in a practical way? It means when you see troubling data on the performance of some groups of kids in your community, don't just ignore it. Don't just dismiss it and explain it away. You can actually help to create demand for change by pointing to progress elsewhere and by pressing for similar results. Yes, this may make you annoying. My encouragement, though, is be annoying. You don't, if you're outside of education, you're trying to help your system improve, you don't do the leaders in that system any favors by shutting up. Right? 
you do favors by building demand for change because good leaders use that leverage to make change faster. Two, I'm gonna wade into this one here. Okay, look at wrapping the Common Core Standards is really, really an important tool. And let me say why. You know, you all know, we all talk about low expectations all the time. We talk about it, though, as if it were some sort of abstract concept, you know, floating around in the ether. But where those expectations find their most concrete form is in the daily assignments that we give to children in their classrooms. And those things matter. And I'll show, I'll show you why. Let me show, I want to give you a couple of sample assignments. These are both, the first two are from two 10th grade so-called college prep English courses from two high schools in the same district, but opposite sides of town. So take a look at this, and if you don't mind, just read through that assignment, and as you read, just think a little bit about what would a student have to do to get an A on that assignment? Would you just think about the challenge there, and hold that in your head. Okay, we're going to go to the other side of town and look at a typical assignment from the high poverty school. See the difference? Let me give you seventh grade examples. Typical writing assignment in a suburban middle school. Again, look at what we're asking seventh graders to do. This is how we define an appropriate assignment in writing for them. And I'm going to take you across town to the high poverty middle school where writing assignments more often look like that. What we realize as we stand back from the work we've been doing with classroom teachers in this country, what we're realizing is we have one set of kids in this country that gets a pretty steady diet of assignments that look like the first ones in each of those sequence. Assignments that push, that challenge, that build. And assignments at the end of the year are more challenging than those at the beginning. So you know there was a plan there. We get another set of kids in this country that have a pretty diet, steady diet of assignments that look like the second one in each series. A lot of them aren't even that good. A lot of coloring assignments, a lot of collages, a lot of drawing to keep kids busy, right? You don't have to think about that too long to know how huge a difference that makes. Now these new standards, go ahead and modify them if you need to to make them Indiana specific, whatever you need to do for political reasons. But these standards represent hugely important opportunity to change this. But you also know that it won't change automatically. Just having new standards doesn't do the trick. It's about really working with teachers to have a sets of units assignments that they can give in common examples of what good student work looks like. So we really build a profession's capacity, not just to teach the easy kids to these standards, but, um, but the more challenging kids as well. And for those of you outside of education, especially those of you who are employers, it's really, really important that you pay attention to this and press forward as well. Because when you finally give a common core aligned assessment in Indiana, your results will drop. And if folks haven't been prepared for that, if they don't understand this is finally honest information, they'll think their schools are doing worse. So it's about, about broadening that understanding and support. Third, I don't have to tell anybody in this room about mining the data and developing a culture of responsibility around it, but that's really, really important. In every case where you have schools and districts and whole communities moving forward, it's because the data is there, it's broken up every which way, and there's broad ownership for changing it. And let me be clear here, it's not just about the low-hanging fruit, right? It's not just about bringing the bottom up. It is also about moving the needle and moving more low-income kids and kids of color into the highest ranges of achievement. You know, when you look at the last few years of data, what you see are these really, really encouraging findings in reducing the number of kids performing in that ugly red level. So as you can see here, 
year after year after year, we've really begun to press down the number of kids performing at that lowest level. But while we've been making progress over time in getting more of our white students to the advanced levels of achievement, as you can see here, we are not making that same progress as you can see here for African Americans, nor for Latinos. <coughs> nor for low income kids. So the only kids who are moving up in this country in strong ways at the advanced level are white and affluent students. And remember what your state superintendent said, because it's so important. We got to grow every child, including kids who are coming in at the higher levels initially. Fourth, <clears throat> you know, there's been a lot of momentum nationally around this thing called teacher effectiveness. And I want to just say a word or two about why it's important. We've now got about 15 years of data that tells us kind of unequivocally that we have one set of teachers in this country who no matter what kind of kids are sitting in front of them, take those kids from wherever they are strongly up. And we've got another set of kids in this country who no matter what kind of teachers in this country, who no matter what kind of kids are sitting in front of them, take those kids no place at all. And in fact, in this recent study from Los Angeles, what they realized is the top quarter of their teachers were producing every year about six months more learning gains than teachers in the bottom group. And that difference makes a huge difference for kids, especially for kids who are starting at a low level of achievement. Those who are assigned to three weak teachers in a row will essentially never recover. Those assigned to three strong teachers in a row move from the below basic level to close to the advanced level in just three years. So there are very big differences amongst our teachers, but it's all, you know, even in places that have three rating levels, we rate the vast majority as if they were exactly the same. You, you know, especially those of us who do work outside of education, know that people don't do better unless they get honest feedback and support to get better. Right? So changing that is really important. Is it easy? No. Are the formulas that the so-called policy experts have put forward where 50% has to be on student achievement, 50% on something else, are those right? No. But not, but not acting on these differences. Not acting to support and grow the weaker teachers in getting better or helping them out of the profession does huge damage to kids every year. It's not just about teachers, though, if we know anything from the research on effective schools is that you're never going to have an effective school without an effective leader. And if your state or your district doesn't have a very clear plan to grow new leaders, then you got a problem, right? This is way, way too important. No, no offense to higher ed, but way, way too important to be left to higher ed. <clears throat> Six, I don't need to tell anybody in this room this, but it's really important to remind people um, who are not in education that all of this is easier if we start early. There's a lot of newish research that tells us that a lot of brain development is occurring in the first few years of life. And if we harness that growth, and re especially for our most um, impoverished kids, we can get them to school ready to learn. And it is not, it is definitely not um, rocket science to know that we all ought to be moving to provide more supports, especially for our neediest families in those early years. In fact, high quality preschool education is probably the best investment we can make. <clears throat> finally, 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 let's end by talking about the gaps in opportunity achievement. And I will remind you what I said earlier, and that is. Yes, we know the gaps bef begin before kids arrive at the schoolhouse door. But rather than organizing our system to ameliorate that problem, we've organized our system to exacerbate it. Mm -hmm. Those practices aren't good for kids. 
those practices aren't good for our country, and they're certainly not good for our economy as well. We are basically taking the diversity that should be America's competitive edge in the international marketplace, and we are systematically obliterating that edge. Don't just stand by and watch that. Even if these are not your personal children, speak up, demand the data, make sure it's disaggregated, demand progress. The work you're doing is hugely important, and thank you, thank you, thank you for what you do.